that I got licensed in real estate. And the weirdest thing about that was I went on an interview with a broker and she was so cool. And she said to me, you know, you remind me a lot of myself when I was starting out. And she, this woman made so much money. She was really hungry. And she says, and that's what scares me about you. And I said, well, is that a compliment or what? Mm. And she says, well, I'm trying to save you. And I said, trying to save me? She goes, because I gave up so many of my dreams mm -hmm. chasing, you know, you know, uh, money so much that um, all the things that she wanted to do took a back seat. This was her plan B, okay, mm -hmm. to do real estate. But it quickly became her plan A, and her plan A just faded away. And she put aside having children and getting married for, for years, and she regretted that. So she, she asked me, you know, is this what you really want to do? Is this, do you really want to be a realtor? And I said, no, I just want to make some money, you know? And she says, well, I don't know. I don't, I would love to hire you because I think you've got the gift of gab. And she goes, I think you could sell. She goes, but I don't want to hire you because I feel like you have a lot of dreams that you need to really live. And I said, I couldn't believe how this woman, it was like a, like the universe speaking to me. Or really? Yeah, really? and that was on, on, I think, on a Friday. And I said, no, well, I'll come back. You know, are you going to hire me or what? Because I really would like to work with you. And she says, yeah, you're hired. She said, come Monday. And I said, she goes, but I, did, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't tell you what I'm telling you. And I said, okay. Hmm. So Saturday night, I injure my hand. Hmm. Next thing you know, I'm in the hospital. I'm scheduled for surgery. I severed my tendons. It was terrible. And, um, yeah, and I call her up on Monday. And I said, you know, I can't, I can't make it. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do this. And she chuckled a little bit. And she says, okay, I'll be here if you ever change your mind. It's almost like she was happy that mm -hmm. I turned down the job. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm going through this whole story is because if it wasn't for that, I would have never went back to my filmmaking. I would have never mm -hmm. gone back to my filmmaking dreams. And I started realizing after I went through being depressed and disabled and and real and feeling sorry for myself pretty much, I woke up and I snapped out of it and I said, what do you have that you wish you could? And, and I realized I had the gift of time. All that time that I had working so much and going to New York Film Academy and, and trying to juggle so many things at once, I didn't really have time to work on a feature film, which is what I really dreamt of doing. And I said, now I have the time. So mm -hmm. literally with two fingers, the only two fingers that worked, I wrote my screenplay and I wrote my feature. And next thing you know, a month and a half later, I was in pre-production. And wow. everybody told me, there's no way you could do that. There's no way you're going to be able to do a feature film. You don't have any money. You don't have this. You don't have that. And I said, well, the best thing I could do is put it in motion and things will fall into place. And they did. And it was a struggle, but it, mm. it did happen. And wow. if it wasn't for that, realizing that I had this time, I would have never done that. So after all those short films in New York Film Academy, I started right away doing that feature film. And it literally took me years to complete mm. Years. I love that. Even the interviewer knew that she didn't belong there. I mean, talk about God or the universe telling you, hey, <laughs> this is not meant to be. I love that. Well, no matter what, say you get through the challenges and obstacles, well, what do you do from there? You just can't sit around and wait for things to happen. You got to get out there and move, hustle, make things happen, or else nothing is going to come about. And that brings me back to Rebecca Flott. And here's her advice about that and the keys to success. The key is, listen to me, if you are an artist and you want to paint for a living or if you want to make money in any way in the creative community, there's no way ever, ever, that you can show up one day and expect to have the results of 10 years, two years, okay, of work. The key is that you consistent show up when even no one is paying you. Mm -hmm. It has to be the self-motivated that you say, no one is paying me and I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the work. Guess what? One day someone will. Yep. Right? One day someone will. But you have to work for yourself. But you also have to have the urgency to believe that it is important to work for myself. Mm. So when I work at that painting seat teaching, I used to tell everybody, 
this is my bridge, baby. I'm going to have many different, this is my bridge, but I'm going to use this bridge to do the best. I'm going to be the best here that I can be. See, she was so focused on what she wanted, not what she didn't want. She was focused on what she wanted. She knew this was leading to that and it was going to lead to something else. But she showed up and she was consistent. That's the key. Which leads me to one of my most amazing guests, Alex Ferrari. He is a filmmaker, writer, podcaster of indie film Hustle and Bulletproof Screenwriting and Film Entrepreneur, among many things. And I had two hours plus with him. It was a master class, folks. And he goes on to this aspect of it, having to show up and putting in the work. Things are not just going to happen. You have to put in the time, put in the hustle, and eventually things will happen for you. He offers some great little tales about that. So listen to what he has to say about the hustle. So the Pounding the Stone is based on a book by Joshua Metcalf called Pounding the Stone. And and in that book, he explores this basic story and, 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 and breaks it down. Stonemasons, when they're hitting a stone or a rock to, to break it, they're obviously using their hammer and they're hitting that stone again and again. From an outsider's perspective, you look at this person and he looks like he's crazy because every time he hits it, nothing happens. He just keeps hitting the stone, but nothing except the stone's not moving. He just keeps pounding and pounding the stone. He hits it a hundred times, nothing. But on the hundred and one time, it cracks. And that's an analogy for all of us to live by. It's not about what you're seeing. It's about putting that grind and putting that work in because if you wouldn't have hit it a hundred times, you wouldn't have been able to get to the hundred and one where it actually cracked for you. So that's a great analogy for our careers. You just got to keep grinding. You got to keep hustling. And you keep doing the work, something happens. You will crack your stone eventually. It might not be the way you want it cracked, but it will crack. There's, a, there's another book by that same author called uh, Chop Wood, Carry Water. Uh, and it's about basically, you know, this guy wants to be like the samurai archer. And he wants to just get into the archery. And they're like, no, 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 no. You take a couple years of chopping wood and carrying water. You're not ready for that yet. Like, do you ever no. see um, that documentary, uh, Jiro Dream, uh, Dreams of Sushi? No, not yet. So good. Oh, my God. It's so good. It actually made me start eating sushi back when I ate fish. Um, but I, I, this master, he's, a ma- he's the only sushi chef ever to get a Michelin star. Ever. So that's yeah. how good he is. And his restaurant's literally in a subway in Tokyo. So it's unpretentious. But three, four months to get in. And you sit there and, and you just sit there and you, you basically eat whatever he gives you. And you, you got to stay quiet. It's like soup's not, soup, soup Nazi. But, yeah, but awesome. when you're done with his course, your life is altered. I mean, that's how good he is. But the point of, uh, the reason I'm bringing that movie up is because when you apprentice with him, you can't, touch, you can't touch fish for three years. You can't touch a fish for three years. You will have to master rice. You will cook rice for three years before you touch a fish. In the world that we live in today, how many filmmakers are willing to, to cook the rice, mm-hmm. to chop the wood and to carry the water? Everybody wants the lottery ticket. Everybody wants to get there faster, hack the system. I wasted a lot of my years doing st- stupid shit like that. Excuse, excuse the language. Doing, st- doing stuff like that. I, was, I wasted my time because I kept trying to hack the system. But if I would have just sat down and started doing the work without an attachment to outcome, to do the work for the sake of doing the work, That's what it's about. Because every time you make a short, it's not going to blow you up. Steven Spielberg is not going to come down from Mount Hollywood and say, you shall direct. That's not the way the world works. Does it happen every once in a blue moon? Absolutely. Can I count it on my one hand or two hands? Yes. Over the course of decades, how many times that's happened. Okay? But it's about pounding that stone, about carrying that water and chopping that wood. you got to keep doing that, those innate things. So reading a book every day, listening 
taking courses every day, going out, shooting short films just to shoot them, not to show them, to shoot them. I always love telling the story of Robert Rodriguez, who's a mythical figure in the independent film space. Before he shot El Mariachi, he, he had shot already probably 25 or 30 short films that he never showed anybody to understand and learn the craft. So by the time he got to his first short film, which was Bedhead, he had already learned so much from making these little VHS movies with his family, which he edited between two VHS to VCRs, yeah. that he was able to understand the tool set. He was able to understand that he was cooking the rice. And that's what it takes. Not many filmmakers are willing to do that. That's why every single one of these gods, these filmmaking gods, you know, the Nolans, the Finchers, the this, the that. You know, Fincher was a commercial director for decades. Ridley Scott was working in commercials for decades. Tony Scott was working in commercials for decades. Michael Bay, Antoine Fuqua, whether you like their movies or not, they are craftsmen. They are craftsmen. And they understand their craft impeccably. Regardless if you like their movies or not, that's irrelevant. Can they tell can they tell a story, a visual story? Can they make a movie? Absolutely. And of course, I've mentioned my biggest enemy throughout my entire life has just been sheer laziness. Just staying in my comfort zone, not breaking free. But guess what? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, decades go by. And you realize, damn, what did I do with my life? <laughs> not doing anything. And that's why I liked Alex Ferrari so much. We are very similar. He spent many years wasting time and not focusing in on what he wanted and the road took him to a podcast of all things but it also led to so much more giving him the motivation to make his own feature-length movies write his book uh, create the uh, indie film hustle tv video streaming service and so much more but even then many of us turn our backs on our art and guess what happens? Suffering. I am a living testament to that. When I turned my back on my art, did regular BS jobs, I was not happy. I wasn't fulfilled. I felt like crap. But when I was acting, writing, directing, drawing, life was more colorful. And no matter what, your art will call you back. It's there. You can't get rid of it. There's been times that I wish I didn't have it in me, really. Just because I felt life would be simpler if I just didn't have this in me and I could just focus on regular day-to-day -day stuff and just get through life. But I've learned to embrace my art and my creativity. And that's what leads me back to Elke Blasi. She had turned her back on it, but her art was calling her back. And she offers another interesting story about that. Take a listen. My art was always calling me back specifically because mm -hmm. I remembered that I wrote down a list of goals. And um, I remember I needed to build a bookcase. I was building a bookcase because I had so many books and I wanted mm -hmm. them, you know, neat, neat and organized. I need to be neat and organized when I'm working. Mm -hmm. So everything was all over the place. And I had asked my father to help me put it together. And while I was out, he kind of took it upon himself to do it. That's the kind of guy he was. He didn't want me to mm -hmm. have to worry about it. You know, I was, I had an injury and he did it. But he put it against my list of goals that I had written um, and I, that I attacked to the wall. So he didn't bother taking it down. So he put the bookshelf against it. And at one point, like one of my shelves collapsed and I had to move the bookcase. And um, I saw that, that note that I had written about you know, my list of goals. And I had checked off New York Film Academy. I checked off the shorts that I've done. And then what wasn't checked off was my first feature film. Mm. So I think it was really at that moment that I said, holy crap, what am I doing? Mm. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I gained 20 pounds because I was also a ballroom dancer at the time. I was very physically oh, wow. active. I worked out all the time. Yeah, my dancing was like a big thing of mine, but I knew I was never going to pursue that as a lifelong dream, mm. but it was something that I, you know, was involved with um, tremendously, and I loved it, the dance mm. world, but I couldn't dance anymore because I couldn't hold my partner's hand and 
do those kind of things because of my injury. And I literally gained 20 pounds and I got depressed because I never looked 20 pounds heavier. I, I never not went to the gym. I, mm. It was it was horrible. It was, But I was feeling sorry for myself. So instead of realizing that something good could 